Before we get started with the show, we wanted to draw your attention to our crowdfunding page on Patreon. If you've been enjoying Always Take Notes, please do consider supporting us there. It helps us to keep the podcast going. If you support us on Patreon, you can get a great selection of rewards, including a shout out on the show and a selection of successful magazine pitches. If you pledge $10 a month, you get a free two month trial to Otter worth $26 alongside the other rewards. Otter offers automated transcription and live note taking for in-person and virtual meetings. I found it to be a huge help when organizing interview material. You also get access to a series of mini episodes from previous guests on the show in which they answer three revealing questions. The latest episode features William Dalrymple, and here's a snippet. Well, I mean, there are people I know who really, really like office life and love being in an office and chatting to people at the coffee machine and so on. In that case, probably writing is not the job for you. Um, I have to say I'm very sociable, but I'm very happy not to see anyone until the evening. (laughs) <laughs> well, I like to get out and leave the house. And get off the Hello and welcome to Always Take Notes. In this episode, Rachel and I spoke with the novelist Tracy Chevalier. We spoke to Tracy about her rigorous research process, about the phenomenon that was the girl with the pearl earring, and about the usefulness, or not, of the label historical fiction. It's a great episode and we hope you enjoy it. Welcome, Tracy, to Always Take Notes. It's fantastic to have you on the show. I wondered if we could start by talking about your research process. You're often described as a method writer. Um, you learned to paint for The Girl with the Pearl Earring. You took a job as a tour guide in Highgate Cemetery for Falling Angels. And you learned certain stitching techniques for a single thread. Where did that process come from? And why do you think it's important to really steep yourself in the, um, in the method for uh, writing your novels? To be honest, it wasn't a deliberate decision. It just sort of grew. But I realized it's it's actually also kind of a, a, a shortcut to writing better. I found uh, when I was writing Girl with a Pearl Earring that I knew I'd be describing Vermeer painting. And I thought, well, I don't really know how to paint. I don't know how you hold a paintbrush or how you mix colors or, you know, what, what, uh, layers you put on a painting. How do you start it? How does it feel? How does it smell? And, uh, so I thought, well, maybe I'll just take a painting class. And that really helped. It helped make it easier for me to write what Vermeer was doing. And uh, subsequently, in other books, as you mentioned, and a couple other books like uh, Remarkable Creatures, which is about the fossil hunter, Mary Anning, I went out on the beach and looked for fossils because that's what she spends a lot of the book doing. And it's much easier for me to describe it if I've done it. So similarly, in my most recent novel, A Single Thread, it's about a group of women who embroider cushions and kneelers for Winchester Cathedral. And once I, I started making a couple of things that my character makes, in my, my heroine makes in the book, and I could feel what it felt like to make it. So when it came to describing it, it feels accurate and authentic. Uh, so it's in a way as simple as that. I mean, I really enjoy doing it. So I'm I'm writing a novel about Venetian glass now, and I am making, I've made a couple of beads because I'm I'm focusing on glass beads, and I've spent a couple of sessions making them, and now I know how hard it is and how, oh, your wrist feels like that when you're turning it. Oh, when you have both hands doing two different things, how does it make your brain feel? Ah, it's really hot in this particular area, and you have to be really careful when you're doing this, so I better write that. So I I know all of these things, and it's it's as simple as that, really. And now it's hard to imagine not doing that. And Tracy, where does this the research fit in your process? Because we've talked to a lot of writers about about research, and a point that Ian Rankin told us some time ago was that he used to do research first, and then moved 
to, to writing his first draft. But he, he stopped doing that because he felt that if you do it at that point in the process, before you have some sense of where the novel's going, that you can put a lot of time into researching. He, he gave the example of, say, a particular blood test or something that then ends up on, on the cutting room floor as the novel develops. So do you do you have a skeleton of the story or a draft before you're doing this really in-depth process, or do you start solidly with the research? I do start pretty solidly with the research. Um, mainly, I think the difference between me and Ian is that he sets his books now. So he doesn't have to research how you light a room or uh, what kind of utensils you use to eat with or, or what, you, uh, what you wear. He knows all that stuff for Rebus or whoever he's writing about. But, but for me, I, I usually start in a a country or a, um, a, a time that I don't know, 19th century America, what did they wear? What did they eat? What did things smell like? 17th century Holland. Now I'm at the moment in uh, 15th century Venice. And I, I have to start building the, the world around me from the ground up. So I have to research a lot of stuff before I would feel confident to write anything um, in set at that time. So the the first, my very first novel, The Virgin Blue, is partly contemporary and partly set in uh, 16th century France and Switzerland. It's about French Huguenots. And I remember vividly writing the first scene for this uh, historical section. And these um, this peasant family come in from the fields and they sit down and have a meal. And I, as I wrote, I thought, I wonder what they sit on. Do they sit on chairs in the 16th century or is it benches? And um, and then I thought, well, I don't even know if they used a fork then. Uh, and even if they ate then, when did they have their big meal? Maybe they had it in the middle of the day. Maybe I'm making a complete mistake. And I realized after a page of this that I, and I hadn't done any research, I realized I had to start all over again and research all of the everyday life. Plus, then, of course, you have to research the, the wider, not just the everyday life, but what's going on politically, what's going on socially, um, all sorts. Plus all the stuff, you know, if you're writing about 19th century fossil hunting, you have to figure out what it is that they're doing. So there, there's just an enormous amount of, of research to do. So I, I probably do a good six months before I actually start writing the, the story. But on the other hand, once you start writing the story, the story throws up lots of questions. So you you uh, you realize uh, I'm writing this novel set in Venice, and this gondolier keeps showing up, and I I just thought I have got to find out more about the boats. Um, so uh, I, I've had to stop and do some research about all the different types of boats they had and what it feels like. In fact, I was in Venice recently, and I did a class in rowing a gondola to see it, feel what it felt like. And that, um, so that happens a lot. So research really, I mean, I, I do a core of it to start with, but then the, the book all the way throughout the writing, I'm, I'm constantly researching more. And in fact, I feel like the research never ends because there are still Vermeer books that have come out that I feel like I ought to read, even though <laughs> that book came out, you know, 21 years ago, Girl with a Pearl Earring, I still feel like I need to check things out. How do you create that sense of discipline with the research? As you say, it could go on sort of infinitely. How do you know when to sort of draw a line and start writing? The story, like the story, as I'm researching, it gives me an opportunity to, um, in the back of my mind, I'm always tailoring the research to what my characters might do or say or feel. And um, after a while, they're clamoring away in my head and wanting to do things. And I need to write them down so that they can do things. But also what happens is uh, usually a research is this activity of, of trying to get the right information and, and most of the time, at, towards the end of it, the, the process, I start feeling like, oh, I don't really understand this particular period or this particular subject. If only I could find exactly the right book or exactly the right article that's going to make me answer all my questions. And then I start to realize, Tracy, that book is the book you have to write. 
that's what you're looking for. You're not looking for somebody else to tell you these things. You've actually got to pull your finger out and do it. So that's when I, um, the story starts to come out and the, and the, it's almost like the research itself that I've been looking for comes out of me. You sort of t- touched on this already a bit, but the, the other perennial question that we ask uh, fiction writers is whether they're a, a plotter or a plunger. So whether there's someone who has the arc of the novel and, and the characters and the plot worked out in advance or whether they, they just dive in and, and follow their notes. I mean, with you, with this exhaustive research process, how do you fall between those two poles? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I remember years ago, um, I was at the New York Public Library and they had a uh, an exhibition of manuscripts by various writers. And one of them was Paul Auster, and it was the first chapter of his uh, New York stories. And it was the outline for the chapter. It wasn't the actual writing itself. And the outline was pages and pages and pages long. And um, he plotted out every thing, every single thing that his character did before he wrote it. And I'm not like that at all. Um, I, 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 but I don't exactly plunge in either. I have, I'm a kind of a combination of both. I know more or less emotionally and psychologically where my main character is going where they start, what they're like at the beginning, and how they how they change over the course of the book and where they are at the end. But I don't always know what the things are that are going to happen to them or they are going to make happen that are going to get them there. Um, so I might know some of the peaks. Like if you think of it as, you know, the Hollywood uh, arc that they talk about in a, in a film... I kind of know the arc emotionally, and then my writing process takes me through what happens physically to them to get them along that arc. arc. And I might start a, um, a scene sort of knowing how it go- it's going to end, but a lot of times um, I sit down and I during the day, and I'm uh, the day I'm writing, and I I just. Um, think, okay, they're going to do that, but let me try this and let me try that. So I have two different possibilities or a third possibility and maybe it doesn't work and maybe I backtrack or throw it away or, or restart. And, and it's, it's just a constant um, uh, checking and, and a kind of spontaneity to what might happen next, although I, I know what general direction I'm going in. I suppose it's like if you think about a car journey and you think, well, I'm, I'm going to take the motorway to such and so to Bristol going along the M4. And then you think, well, actually, maybe I'll get off on the this smaller road and take a detour and go and see Stonehenge or I'm going to go um, or I might go up to Oxford. I might go to Reading. Maybe I'll take this smaller road or no, that didn't work. I'm going to get back on the big road. And you, you, um, I'm fiddling around like that, but somehow I managed to get to where I need to go at by the end. And the same is true of your approach to writing characters. I think I read you sort of work them out on the page. Yes. Well, I think for any writer, when you're um, starting a book, you don't know your character as well as when you finish it. Finish it. And I know there are some writers who sort of, they create a character, maybe they don't start writing, they, they create a character and they think, what if the character was going to the grocery store, what would they buy? Or, or what if they, were, um, if they were going on a holiday, where would they go? Or if they got into a stressful situation at a dark alley in the middle of the night, how would they respond? And I get that, but I just do that on the page. You know, I, I don't, spend all my time thinking about all the other possibilities of their lives. Although I usually know their backstory a bit, but I, I kind of find my way. And that's what drafting is all about. You write the first draft and you're, you're kind of floundering around the first few chapters. I mean, uh, and you, and you maybe say the first quarter to a third of the book, you don't really know your characters that well, or, or even the setting that well, but, um, after a while, you get into your stride and you start to know them better. And by the end of the draft, by the end of the book, you know them well. And so then you go back and loop back around to the beginning and rewrite the first. I often edit more in the first quarter, first third of a book than I do the last two thirds because I'm much more confident in what I'm doing. Um, 
for because I've gotten to know my characters. So it's really about spending time with them on the page. And that's how I get to know them. Could we roll back now to the start of your career, Tracy, and to when your interest in books and, and reading began? Is it right that when you were a child, you used to go every week to the library and, and get a big stack of books and that you had this relationship with the librarian and they'd sometimes set a book aside for you specially? Yes, Mrs. Carney. She had a huge influence on my life. I um, the, the public library was near my school and it was also within walking distance. In those days, kids, you know, you could walk age six um, on your own uh, to the library and back 15 minutes away. And, um, and that was really uh, great. I would go, I'd get a stack of books. Mrs. Carney would ask me, oh, Tracy, so did you read the, you know, Witch of Blackbird Pond or whatever it was she had given me the week before? What did you think? And I would say, oh, I like this bit. I really didn't like this bit. And and we'd have a long discussion about the book. And then she'd say, oh, I've, I've got something special for you. Um, I don't, I think you're ready for this. I think you've, you've grown up enough. And she'd hand me some, another book and I would read that and then we'd discuss it. It was like a mini book club, you know, back before they had them. And and um, I, I spent a lot of time, I was a, quite a, a, I was a bookish child. I was quite plump. I was, um, my mother was, uh, got sick when I was three and she died when I was eight. And so I spent a lot of time having to be quiet so that she could sleep. And um, I, I was a bit of a loner, not entirely. I had friends, but I uh, I grew up in an integrated neighborhood. I was one of the few white kids in a black neighborhood. And so there were a lot of kind of stresses on my my growing up. And I think I used, my aunt said once that I said, I, I'm never lonely when I'm in a book, when I'm reading a book. And so I think I used them as a form of escape. And they became a, just an integral part of my life in in a way that like brushing your teeth is. You couldn't imagine going to bed without brushing your teeth. I can't also imagine going to bed without reading a bit or, or whenever I can read. So, um, they've always, I couldn't imagine not having a book on the go. You just, there's always one. I'm always reading at least one. And, um, so yeah, they were very important. And I, I used to say that I wanted to be, when I grew up, I wanted to be either a writer or a librarian because libraries were where I got my books from and I just thought it'd be great to be involved in them. What were some of the books that you read um, as a child and how do you think they were formative to your own understanding of your craft? I read, um, oh gosh, uh, the Walter R. Brooks Freddy, Freddy the Pig books. He was, uh, it was all these talking animals in a farmyard um, and there was a long series of them and they were wonderfully plot driven. I rather like plot and, uh, they were great. Um, I, uh, I liked a bit of fantasy. I liked Joan Aiken and Susan Cooper. So those are sort of early English influences that I didn't even realize I was an Anglophile until I started living here. And, um, but I think maybe the biggest influence was Laura Ingalls Wilder the Little House in the Big Woods series of eight books. And the funny thing is they were, I guess, what you would call historical novels, though I didn't think of them that way at the time. But I I, I loved them. I identified with Laura, the main character, who was, you know, she wasn't a good girl. She was kind of greedy and, um, and temp- had a temper. Uh, and it was about a pioneer family who moved from Wisconsin, keep going west because their father wants more land or they um, they want to get away from people or the for various reasons they move west. And um, it's only as an adult and I've reread them and read more about her and read biographies that I start to understand. Well, first of all, the incredible uh, racism about concerning Native Americans which she's been sort of slammed for now, although you, you also have to read books like that in the context of the time. But, um, but also, I, as an adult, I sort of see what the parents were like. You know, I always read it from her point of view. She was a kid, and then she grew up, throughout the books, she grows up into a young woman. And of course, I identified with her and her sisters. 
But when you look, when you read it, when you're a parent yourself or you're an adult, you sort of go, oh, God, the father, Charles Ingalls, I think was probably would probably be um, uh, diagnosed as bipolar now because he would just he was, you know, really quite manic um, and wonderful company. And then he would just get annoyed at everything and say, we're moving west. And his poor long suffering wife had to keep upping sticks and moving with him and without complaining. And, um, and I, so I sort of see it in a different light now, but, um, I, which I kind of love. I mean, that's the whole thing. When you read a book, if you reread books, you're a different person too. And it's, it's quite a nice, uh, it's, it's quite, it reflects you back as well as anything else. And I, I love that. I, I wish there were enough time to read cause I would reread more than I do, but, uh, but those were pretty influential and and I that series and I think now, oh yeah, I'm I'm um I guess I write historical I mean she, hers are quite autobiographical, but she read she wrote them in the nineteen thirties, about the eighteen sixties, and the world had completely changed by the time she wrote them. And um I uh, I guess they were the first example of historical writing for me. And what was your motivation to move to London after university? I was wondering, was it was it a kind of reaction to Oberlin? I mean, I know it has a reputation as a very certainly when I did when I was studying in the US, it had a reputation as a very kind of progressive and things like that. Were you were you seeking something in the old world, or what was what was pushing you in that direction? I um, studied English lit at at Oberlin, and um, my third year. My junior year at Oberlin, I did a semester in London, the the London semester for English majors, and it had a huge influence on me. It taught me so much. The eighteen of us English majors went with our professor, and we we went to the theater twice a week. So we'd read a play, see a production that night, and discuss it the next morning. And it was just um, huge benefit to me critically, and um, and read you know Evelyn Waugh and Virginia Woolf and. Thomas Hardy poetry and to read all of that in situ made a huge difference. Um, and I also just fell in love with London. And when I graduated, I didn't really want to, I, I wanted, I knew I wanted to go into publishing, but I didn't really want to move to New York right away. And two friends and I from the program said, Hey, shall we go back to London for six months? Cause you could get a work permit to, to work for six months. And so we did just for fun. And I, thorough I was sure that I was going to be coming back after six months and then I didn't come back I got I met a guy uh wrong guy but I met him and uh and then I got a job in publishing and then I met the right guy and I just ended up staying and uh that was as surprising to me as it was to anyone but 30 something years later I'm still here (laughs) Um, in those first jobs after university working on reference books, I think it was, how easy was it to make a living? What was it? What was the salary like? <laughs> it's, it's a running theme of the podcast that the answer is not very much. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I remember one week I had done some um, extra work uh, that I was paid for as as freelance some freelance editing from my boss and i i went in to his office and said daniel is there any chance you could pay me like right away for this and he said why are you having some uh, cash flow problems <laughs> like i had some empire you know and and i said uh yes i am and he said well how much have you got in your account and i said 10 pounds <laughs> he just looked at me like horrified. So he wrote me a check right away for what he owed me. Um, so no, I didn't make very much at all. And in fact, I started my illustrious publishing career at uh, as an editorial assistant um, for the Dictionary of Art at Macmillan Publishers. And I actually took a pay cut in order to become a literary editor for St. James Press. But it was a great job. Um, I learned a lot. I I, I edited encyclopedias about writers and I spent a lot of time researching bibliographies in the British Library. I learned how to be accurate. I learned how to research. Um, I commissioned essays from um, academics about writers and 
it was, uh, and I, I learned how to gently edit people and I learned the value of editing. So I learned a lot from it, but I just didn't get paid very much. Can you tell us about your initial forays into, into writing fiction? Is it right that you were, you were writing short stories before the Virgin Blue came out? Yes. When I was editing at St. James, I would at night sometimes write short stories and, um, I sort of, after a while, I built up a, a, a little mini portfolio of them. And I, in fact, I got one published in a short-lived magazine called Fiction. And um, they had just started and they, uh, they took a, a short story I wrote about the, um, one of the mummies in a British Museum called Ginger. And they published it. And then they went out of business before they paid me. So I never got paid. But what was great about it is I sent the story and I was doing a night class um, in creative writing at City Lit. And I wrote the story. I, um, I workshopped it there. And then I sent it into Fiction Magazine. And they responded within like two or three weeks, which is unheard of. Um, usually they sit on them for months and years. And I was just lucky. They um, and they found a slot to publish it. I was in the same edition as Doris Lessing and Ian Banks, and um, it wasn't one of Doris Lessing's finest stories. I think she had grabbed it from the bottom drawer. But I was like, "Wow, great! Here I am." Um, and I don't even mind that I didn't get paid. I was just delighted. I think it was it was wonderful affirmation of. You write a story, you send it in, and it gets published a month or six weeks later. That doesn't happen very often, so that really was very encouraging. And I kept on writing short stories um, for a while. Uh, I mean, that came out in like 1988, 89, and I didn't. Um, it was on, it was only in 1993 that I decided it was time to push this to the next level and. I decided to um, apply for the MA in creative writing at University of East Anglia and I got in. And um, so I went from 93 to 94 for that year. And I had Malcolm Bradbury and Rose Tremaine as my tutors. And that was the first time I was able to actually take myself seriously as a writer. So it was very useful in that way of setting deadlines, giving me a critical audience, expecting a lot from me, expecting me to take myself seriously. And uh, that was where I had the idea to for the novel that became The Virgin Blue. What was the experience of being taught by Malcolm Bradbury and Rose Tremaine like? And also the experience of your fellow students. I found an excellent quote where you said it was dominated by these guys who wore black and wrote subjoicean crap. <laughs> I know. <laughs> It was, um, it was really interesting. And um, some people benefited from the program. A couple of people have gone on to publish, Martin Bedford, uh, Susan Alderkin, um, and uh, Matthew Debatua, and me, and Jeremy Page. You know, we did, out of 18 of us, some of us have managed to publish, and that's good. But it was, there were other people, some people really took it seriously, worked hard, took the criticism well in class and, um, and improved. And others just uh, messed around for the whole year. And one, one guy, a very nice guy, admitted to me that he recycled every, every story, everything that he submitted, because um, you had to submit stuff every six weeks for the class to read, that he had, he didn't write one original thing the whole year he just sort of submitted stuff that he had had written before and and I thought what a waste you know and but it's the guys who wore black and wrote subjoicean crap I mean that's part of the process too in a way you have to find out you have to figure out what it is that you um what you can get away with what you want to get away with what you want to do um and that one of those guys, I remember at the very end, we were we were all drinking afterwards and playing pool. And he said, so what did you what do you think? What are my how did I do? And um, and I was surprised he cared because he act he professed not to care in class about the reader or anybody. And I said, well, you'll you know, you, you're you've uh, come through it, but you do have to care about the reader a little more. 
than you do. Um, and it was interesting too, because when I'd sit in class, cause I, I'd, I'd been in publishing, I knew what deadlines were. And I noticed that the, 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 those of us who did better, Susan Elderkin, Martin Bedford, me, we were all a little bit older. We weren't 22. We were maybe 28 or 30 or whatever. And we had had jobs. We had had deadlines and, and we worked. And when I looked around, I mean, I couldn't make a judgment on my own writing, but I, uh, I looked around the room pretending to be a publisher, like who would I publish? And I thought Susan and Martin. And um, it was partly the quality of the writing and partly the work ethic is, is part of writing. It's not just about being able to put interesting words together and make a lovely sentence and coming up with great metaphors and a great plot and all that. It's also about putting the time in and they did and the other people didn't. And I just thought, yeah, I think I know who's going to make it here, if anybody. And I was right. A message from our sponsor, Vitsu, Melvin's story. We love, love, love our Vitsu shelving. Build quality and ease of assembly is amazing, but it was your service that made the whole process such a joy. So said Melvin from Sydney in this heartfelt message to his Vitsu planner Sophie in London. Love is a word heard a lot at Vitsu. Other verbs just don't seem to cut it. As with any customer, Sophie considered every detail, so Melvin's bookshelves were perfect for his needs. Passionate about good service, she communicates with all her customers directly, wherever they are in the world. Whether in person or on the other side of the globe, Vitsu's planners hold your hand throughout the process, time and again proving that long distance relationships really do work. Every interaction is handled with love from Vitsu. Vitsu's 606 Universal Shelving System is a modular adaptable kit of parts. It can provide the perfect home for your books, and even the desk from which to write one. Visit vitsu.com, that's V-I-T-S-O-E dot com, or request a free brochure via email at vitsu.com by quoting ATN 606. Vitsu, makers of long living furniture by Dieter Rams. Could you tell us about the gestation of uh, the gold with the pearl earring i'm sure you've, you've told this many times but um it's right that you had a, a poster of the, the vermeer painting on your wall since you were 19 right yes and the poster is still in my office right here um, behind me um yes i went to visit my sister uh in boston and when i walked into her apartment um she had on the wall a poster of Girl with a Pearl Earring, and I, I had never seen it before, and I just stood in front of it, marveling at it. The, the beautiful light, the, the shadow on her face, I'm looking at it now. So the blue and the yellow, the, the incredible texture of her skin and those liquid eyes, and most of all the expression on her face, which I, was unreadable to me. I could never tell if she was happy or sad. And uh, I went out the next day and got a poster um, for myself. And I um, kept it in my, I hung it in my bedroom wherever I lived for the next uh, 15 years. Um, and in fact, I when I came over to London for the London Semester for English Majors, I brought that poster in my suitcase and I hung it up on my wall. Um, I, so I had a, uh, I had a kind of Vermeer, a love for Vermeer, which I um, indulged by trying to see all the Vermeers I could. And there are, there are 36 of them now. And um, I have seen everyone in the flesh, but that was one of my goals in life was to try to see all of them in the flesh. And, uh, you know, there are four in London and there's some in Dublin and Amsterdam and um, all over various places in, in the Louvre and I went to see them all, but I didn't, I didn't think about writing about Vermeer until I had been living with this poster for 15 years. And one morning I, I woke up and I was looking at the, the poster for my bed. And I suddenly thought, I wonder what Vermeer 
did to her to make her look like that. The, that expression is not just an expression, it's actually her response to him. And it was the first time I had ever thought that this look was actually to do with a relationship between the painter and the model, and not just a girl. And I thought, I wonder what their relationship was. Now there's a story. And um, I looked up in the exhibition catalog of, uh, I'd seen her in the flesh for the first time 18 months before in the Moritz house at an exhibition and um, in The Hague. And I, I looked up in the catalog and read about the painting and it said, they don't know who she is. They don't know who any of the models in his paintings are. And I thought, fantastic. That was the best thing I could have read um, because it meant the field was open to me. In fact, they don't know much about him either. So I could kind of make up whatever I wanted. And I just spent the next three days thinking about what I, what I thought that look could be. And, uh, and that was how the book emerged. Well, that's actually a perfect segue to my next question, which was the balance between fact and fiction. Um, I read that you were careful to be true to the known facts, but because I guess so much was unknown, you had quite a lot of license to kind of plug the gaps. Yes, I, um, I was lucky in that way. Uh, so I, I try not to make up things about real people that um, don't, you know, we, we know isn't true. So the, the best example I can think of is, is in my novel, Remarkable Creatures, about Mary Anning, the fossil hunter in Lyme Regis. She lived her whole life in Lyme Regis, barely traveled. Um, she did go to London once for five days in 1829. And it would have been really helpful. My book was set between um, 18, 1799 and 1824, ends in 1824. And um, I really wanted Mary to go to London. It would have helped the novel a lot if I could have had her there, but I knew that she didn't go, and I couldn't make her go there if I knew that she hadn't gone. And so I had to get her friend to go instead. Her friend, Elizabeth Philpot, also existed, but we don't know if she went to London. She's from London, but she lived in Lyme Regis, and I sent her on the journey instead, and that's what I did also with Vermeer was to just fill in the gaps in his life. You know, we know that he married a woman named Katerina who was Catholic. He probably converted in order to marry her. He had, was Protestant. They had 11 children, four others who died. So they had 15 children in all. Um, they were in debt. They lived in a certain house. He had a, a studio upstairs. I mean, there's just, that's about all we know. And, uh, but there's lots, you know, what he was actually like as a person, we don't know. We can only surmise from looking at his paintings because he didn't leave any writings. He didn't even leave any drawings. So much, a lot of it, I just had to use common sense for what the little bit that we did know and then winkle out what I could, what I could think made sense about him as a character. So like the, the main thing I thought was that, um, he was he was in a household of eleven children, so he would have had servants. It was been it would have been very very noisy, and yet his paintings are incredibly quiet and focused, and are usually of a solitary woman in a corner of a room. And I thought, how do you achieve that when you've got this huge household of noisy people? Will you compartmentalize? So he probably said something like, you know, this is my studio. Nobody comes in here except the maid to clean it. So he, he kept his different parts of his life separate, which is what allowed him to make the painting as intense as it was of the, of the girl. And she was the servant. So, you know, none of it is going out there on a limb. It's all based on kind of comp common sense. But I, ha I did have to make it up but I tried to base it on as much fact as I could. And when did you realize it was going to be a mega hit? Um, did you, we heard about you got this call from Time Magazine in, in January of 2000. I mean, was that, was that the moment or was there a particular moment that you knew that it was going to be a smash? And, and how do you feel about it now, 20 years on? I think I knew, I didn't know it was going to be a hit. For sure when I wrote it, and for sure when it was first published in the UK, it was published here in August of 1999. 
It it was it got respectful reviews, but um, it had a terrible cover. <laughs> you couldn't imagine you could do that with a Vermeer painting, but it's possible. And it, I thought, oh, it's going to sink gently out of sight. But the American publisher published it in January, which I thought would probably be a terrible time. But actually, now I know that that's when they often publish unknown. There's space. There's space. The excesses of of Christmas are over and you can, you have the space for new talent. And they had a gorgeous cover. Uh, and uh, the time between Christmas and New Year's, just before the book came out, I got this call from Time Magazine, the, 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 the London desk, saying, we need to send a photographer around to take a photo of you be, to run with a review of the book that's going to go up coming time. And, and I was like, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a friend. They, they left a message. I was out. And I thought, this is somebody just making fun of me. But I rang the number and it was true. And they sent a photographer around and he was really nice and he was very experienced. And he, uh, he said, look, um, they're not going to review an unknown novel and novelist unless it's a good review. So you're getting a review in Time Magazine. That's good. Celebrate that. That is a good thing. And that's when the first inkling that maybe this was going to be a little bit bigger than I had thought. Um, so that was, and, and the other thing that happened was I sold the film rights before the book was even published. And, and that was also an indication that there's a story there. The story works. Now I know that 95% of books that are bought are optioned for films don't get made. So I, I wasn't in, I was realistic about its possibility of it getting made into a film, but nonetheless that the filmmakers thought that there was something there. I thought that was a good thing, but it took a while. I mean, it was one of those books. It didn't, I don't think it ever reached the top 10 bestseller. It's a, it was a slow, long sell that's still not finished. You know, it's still selling and, and, um, it was a word of mouth success, which is the best kind of success because people, um, people bought it because friends recommended it. And I, and instead of it being some incredible ad, ad campaign or marketing process, it was about people reading a book that they loved and said, you've got to read this. I think you'll love it. And that, that took time. It wasn't like uh, you know, by the end of January, it was a hit. It was more like by the end of it, by the time the public, the, the, um, paperback came out a year later, that that's when I realized, yes, this is really doing well. So, so it, um, it was a, it was, so it didn't give me time. I, you know, I had time to kind of adjust to the idea. You said commercially, it's a blessing creatively. It was a curse at first. Could you tell us a little bit more about why you feel that way? Well, it's really hard. And I think any writer who has one book that sort of stands out from the others that they've written um, has this. Everybody associates them with that book. And uh, when you have, go on to write some uh, the next one, what do you do? Or the, even the one after that or the one after that? People are always assuming you're going to write something that's similar and, um, you know, I had people saying, what painting are you going to do? You're going to do the Mona Lisa next, or, you know, they give me all kinds of advice about what painting I should do next. And, or are you going to write a sequel? Are you going to, and I, and I would joke, yeah, you mean the woman with a pearl necklace, like, you know, to her 10 years later when she's a woman. And I, I just thought, Tracy, you can't do that. You know, you've got to go for what you, um, what your gut tells you you want to write about and, and the readers will follow if they, if they want. And I, um, so I kind of doggedly have pursued my own path ever since. And I'm blessed with publishers who don't tell me what to do. I haven't ever had a publisher say to me, um, oh, don't, you know, I don't think you should write about fossils. Nobody's going to read that or you're going to write about William Blake? Oh, I'm not sure. Um, you're going to write about apples in 19th century America? What? And no, they just let me do it. They let me, they, they are sensible. They let me get on with it. And, um, and that has been a great relief to me because I don't want to write a book about a painting all the time. I don't want to get into a rut. I, I want to do my own thing. And I, 
I just, I do have to trust. I want the readers to trust me that I can tell them a story that they're going to want to read. So following up from Rachel's question, it's a rule of the podcast that we always ask about money and how it interacts with people's writing lives. So be as candid or as guarded as you want. But for yourself, following this, this huge success that you've had, how did that impact you financially? And then when and how were you able to, to make the decision to write full time? I, um, I wrote Girl with a Pearl Earring full time. Uh, after uh, the MA in creative writing, I was freelance editing and writing part time. But the, the day I started research on Girl with a Pearl Earring, I found out I was pregnant. And I, that meant I, I wanted to get the, the book done before the baby came. So I dropped any, um, any editing I had and wrote full time. I was, I was uh, married by then. And um, so we were able to live on my husband's salary while I wrote it. And, um, but I didn't know what would happen with it. Um, and, and it didn't sell, you know, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a huge advance. It was an okay advance. I'd had a tiny advance for, um, the Virgin Blue. Uh, the girl with the pearl earring was bigger, but it wasn't anything to write home about. But it, um, it, once it took off, it started selling, uh, the rights all over the world. And that's what built up. The, and the and and then eventually the film was made and uh, you don't actually make a lot as the writer <laughs> on a film uh, and I wasn't the screenwriter so it it's um it but it then allowed my agents to uh, ask for a larger advance for the next book so that's and I and I started getting two book deals so that I was writing to a contract rather than to a commission rather than uh, just writing in a bubble. And so I was able to write full time ever since then. And I feel incredibly lucky to do that. I think the big, the big thing about the the money is that it means that I haven't had to, um, I haven't had to teach. I haven't had to write journalism. I can just um, afford to write full time novels. I mean, I do do other things. I'm on boards and I occasionally write other pieces, but for the most part, I focus on writing books and that's, but that's been the biggest change. I wouldn't say the rest of my life, like it's not like I've gone out and bought a Ferrari or anything. I, I don't, um, but I, but I feel like I have, um, I have the, I know I have the readership and I have, um, financially I'm stable and that, you know, I couldn't ask for more. It's a really, it, it makes it the whole thing a lot easier because I, I have friends and, and I, I hear a lot of stories about writers struggling and how hard it is. You know, even writers who get fantastic reviews or get shortlisted for prizes are still not selling very much. And um, that must be incredibly frustrating. And when you, I know how hard it, how much time it takes psychically, psychologically to, have to worry about money and I don't have to worry about that and it means that it leaves my mind freer to write. We are coming up against our time limit but a final question for me is about how you think attitudes towards historical fiction have changed during the course of your career. You've said in interviews that peers on your MA were sort of snobbish about the genre. Do you think that's improved over the years? I do. I think um, it started with Rose Tremaine, my tutor, when she wrote Restoration. I think that was a historical novel that had a big effect on how people viewed historical novels. And now um, I think there are so many ways of of telling uh, historical stories and the genre is being um, is becoming less genre and more mainstream. And, and I, I love that about it. You know, I we also all have Hilary Mantel to thank for um, for cracking that one open and um, and making it making it kind of cool to write historical fiction. Um, so I I I never I, I don't particularly like the label because I I tend to see it as I'm writing novels that just happen to be set in the past. But I also get that labels are useful. Um, and so I, uh, I accept it with as much grace as I can, but I also think, you know, it's, there are a lot of ways to write history and I think we're now finding out what those are. And as a, a final question from me, could you tell us a bit more about what you're working on at present and what your, your future projects are? 
I'm working on a novel about Venetian glass. And um, I had the idea, well, somebody else had the idea for me. I get a lot of readers writing to me or coming up to me and suggesting, you should write about so-and-so, you should write about this painting, or you should write about this story. And uh, usually I'm, I'm very polite, but I just think, yeah, that's not how this works. I, I have the ideas myself. And, um, but about 10 years ago, a man came up to me after reading in Milan, and he said, you should write about Venetian trade beads which were um, used in trade all over the world. There are a lot of interesting stories about them. And, uh, uh, and he, here are two books about them. And so I, um, I took the books and I, I glanced at them. I put them on the shelf. And then, uh, but it always stayed in the back of my mind. They're kind of interesting. And, um, and then I started thinking recently, I, I love Venice. I go a lot and it would be great to have an excuse to get to know it better, get to know the history better and get to know um, glass better. So I, um, I ended up uh, uh, contacting him. I saw this man recently um, at a, a conference about beads and I said, Giorgio, thank you, because you really, um, that idea really worked, and I'm now working on it. So it's a, it's a novel um, set in Venice and on Murano, the glass island just off of Venice, and it's set between the 15th and 21st centuries. So it's a big old saga following a family uh, all the way through several centuries, and it traces the, uh, what happens to these beads, how they get used around the world, and also the the sort of history of the ups and downs of Venice as a city, how it went from being a trade, a trade center to being a kind of place of play and grand tours. And now it's a very touristy place. And it's, um, it's been huge fun, but quite hard to, to write during the pandemic. So um, I, and it was irritating because one of the reasons I chose it was that I it was so that I could, go there a lot. And of course, I haven't been able to travel, but recently I was able to go back and um, that would then fill the, the well that had run dry of, of ideas and now I'm full again. So I'm in the middle of writing that. Sounds fantastic, though I fear that you might get a whole fresh wave of unsolicited ideas now that you're turning, turning one of them into a novel. Um, very best of luck with finishing it. And um, thank you very much for coming on Always Take Notes. Thank you. That was the Always Take Notes interview with Tracy Chevalier. Her novel, A Single Thread, is published by HarperCollins. Her website is tchevalier.com and she's on Twitter as Tracy underscore Chevalier. Hello, it's us again. Rachel, what was your takeaway from the interview with Tracy? I loved reading about her research process and the idea of her as a method writer, which is why we started the interview with that. Um, everything from learning to paint and having a bottle, I think it was of linseed oil on her desk as she was writing The Girl with the Pearl Earring so that she would smell the same things that uh, her subjects were smelling. Um, everything, you know, all the different methods that she used to get into the headspace for writing, I thought were really interesting prompts. Um, what about you? I was fascinated by all the novels that people tried to make her write about other paintings after, <laughs> yeah. after Girl with the Pearl Earring was this huge success and how... I think very credibly she resisted that and pushed against doing things. And I also thought the um, the example of, of this novel, I think she was saying there was a novel that didn't work for her that was about Highgate Cemetery, or at least a North London Cemetery, and how she put that to one side. So again, this, this idea of, that she's obviously enormously successful, but lifting the lid on that and seeing how in her creative career, as in so many, there have been avenues that works, but also avenues that haven't. Yeah. And you've been working on a... Slightly grisly piece, Simon. Yeah, yeah. I have been uh, working on a uh, 1843 story um, about heart surgeons and cardiologists. So I've been in hospital this week watching open heart surgery, which has been uh, fascinating, actually. Really, really fascinating. I got some blood on my notebook, but it's all right. I tore the um, the relative page out. Uh, and and yeah, carrying carry on with that. I mean, it's interesting because it's, a, it's an enormously complicated subject and you feel a bit like you're on the first day at school trying to learn like what the mitral valve is and stuff like that but it's been um it's been interesting um what about you Rachel what have you been up to uh nothing quite as um 
interactive or anatomical as that <laughs> I have to say um, yeah no as I said as I mentioned last time sort of in the winding down period now of my diploma so I need to put together the final submission and also finding some books to review there's one actually right by my elbow reminding me to start it um, and various other little bits and pieces here and there very good uh, this has been Always Take Notes hosted by me Simon Aikham and me Rachel Lloyd our producer and social media editor is Artemis Irvin. Our graphic design is by James Edgar and our score is by Jess Danheiser. If you'd like to follow us on social media, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Always Take Notes, on Twitter at Take Notes Always. If you'd like to support us on our crowdfunding page on Patreon, we're on there as Always Take Notes. And if you'd like to get in touch with us via our website or leave a review on iTunes, please do. Many thanks. Goodbye.